Hello everyone, and let's go ahead and get started. First of all, welcome to the Cape Cod Maritime Museum's Fall 2022 Lecture Series. We're very happy to have you with us today. Uh, I am Mary Everett Patrickwin, the museum's Public Programs Coordinator, and behind the scenes making all the technological magic happen is, as always, our Executive Director, Elizabeth York. So again, we're happy to have you with us today. Just wanted to um, <clears throat> say a word of thanks to the uh, Mass Humanities Foundation. Um, uh, so uh, we have a grant through their Bridge Street uh, Initiative. Um, they do wonderful things all across the state of Massachusetts uh, to support the humanities. They're affiliated with the Mass Cultural Council, um, which does wonderful things for the arts and culture. Um, so fantastic um, organizations. We're very lucky to have them um, as really strong presences here in uh, Massachusetts. So uh, again, a, a shout out to them for their support. So uh, also, if um, you find yourself tuning into the lecture series, um, uh, you know, several times a year, if you come into the museum a couple times a year, perhaps you have uh, kids or grandkids involved in our Young Mariner Summer Program, uh, or if you like to uh, attend new exhibits like our Lighthouse exhibit, which uh, just opened uh, a week and a half ago, um, do think about becoming a member of the museum. Memberships start at $50, and uh, not only do you uh, get a number of benefits out of uh, the membership, um, but you're also helping to support this and other great kinds of programming at the museum. So we'll, we hope that you'll think about that. All righty. So today we are very happy to have with us again, Sandy McFarlane. Sandy uh, grew up here on Cape Cod and after graduating from the University of Massachusetts, she became the first female municipal shellfish biologist in the state and was also one of only two women in the Massachusetts Shellfish Officers Association. She went on to have a very long career in, uh, as a shellfish biologist and a conservation administrator with the town of Orleans. And she now runs Coastal Resource Specialists, which is a consulting firm that specializes in shellfish, coastal and watershed issues. She is also the author of a number of books, including Rowing Forward, Looking Backward, uh, Tiggy, as well as Swirling Currents. And she is with us today to talk about shellfishing in New England. Welcome, Sandy. We're happy to have you again. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm going to be just get right to this, and I need to share the screen, and we'll uh, get started. How's that? Okay. I need a little background to tell you of how this came about for me to do this program. In 2019, I got a phone call from a friend who was uh, on the program committee for the 50th anniversary of the New England Estuarine Research Society. Um, this was just before the pandemic, and he asked me if I would do a program on shellfish in our region. And I said, one program? I started to laugh, and I said, well, that's a, a small ad. I said, okay, I'll do it. And when I was, as I was putting it together, I realized that I that I thought that we should do something about every state. And so I decided that the focus should be on the people, the institutions, and the research that had been going on for the last 50 years. It, by design or by necessity, is sort of a cursory look at all of this. Other people would have chosen other things, I'm sure, but this was one person's opinion of some of the highlights of what was taking place in shellfish. And to start with, we have to go way back be much before 50 years. In, in 1905, a man by the name of uh, David Belding graduated from Williams College and immediately got a job with the Massachusetts Commission of Fisheries. He began his work to look at the commercial shellfish in Massachusetts and find out what a lot about them. So he ended up by 1910 and into the, into the teens, writing these monographs, which are on clams, cohugs, scallops, and oysters. They include the life history, fisheries, and propagation potential for all of those species. And they are as valid today as the day they were written. So anybody who 
wants to learn more about shellfish, this is the way, this, these are the, the Bibles, really. We, we all owe a real huge debt of gratitude to this man, anybody who loves shellfish, because they are so complete. Um, the Boswell County uh, Community, I mean, uh, Cooperative Extension put all of these monographs, which are long out of print, into one document, the works of David Belding. And so you can get a copy of all of these by getting in touch with the um, extension, and it's definitely well worth it. So to start the tour of what the last 50 years, I wanted to start with Maine. The first person was Dana Wallace, who was a champion of clams and those who dig them. He, was his, he spent his career with the Department of Marine Resources, and he uh, looked at the predator green crabs and how to get around their predation. He spent an enormous amount of time and experimentation trying to figure out how to protect the clams. Um, and he also sponsored, or his department, he, through his department, sponsored clam conferences in Booth Bay Harbor. And they, they were marvelous. They took um, presentations from people from all over the place of mostly experimental work of what was going on with clams. In 1970, a man by the name of Ira Darling donated nearly 150 acres to the University of Maine. That became the Darling Marine Center, and it's on the Damariscotta River in down east Maine. That is a very important site, and it has been since it started. The first thing they did was to build a building with a flowing seawater system so that they could raise animals and be able to look at them under control conditions. And they had all tanks and, and um, all, of all different kinds that they were working on. They hired Herb Ahaidu, who was, um, had been at many, at several um, important laboratories before he got to Maine, including the um, Milford Lab, which I'll get to later, the, Hot, the Haskin Lab in New Jersey, and the Chesapeake Bay Lab. All of those were important for shellfish. But he ended up at the, with the rest of his career at the Darling Center, and he developed the first mariculture course in the country for graduate students. He was interested not only in the predation of clams, but he was interested in the clams themselves and kind of what made them tick, like their life history. So he did a lot of experimental work in the field to find out about their setting behavior and their, their predation and growth um, potential. And when he got to the setting behavior, he realized that clams set with others of their own kind through a chemical cue, a pheromone. And he wrote the, a, a very important paper called Gregarious Setting, and he realized that other shellfish do that too. Quahogs, unfortunately, are not one of those that set really a whole lot with themselves, with others, but mussels and um, oysters definitely do with this pheromone. The Darling Center hired Sam Chapman as a hatchery manager and the, the operator of the seawater system. He had what many of us call a green thumb with animals. He could grow basically anything. And he worked at the Darling Center for many, many, many years. He also had a real soft spot for uh, small hatcheries, modern power operations. And so he was very instrumental in getting some of these going in the state of Maine. So there were hatcheries getting made in garages and cellars um, all over, up and down the coast. Down river a little bit and around the corner was Ed Myers. He grew the first successful mussel farm. And he learned a lot by doing that, including the fact that eider ducks, one of the chief predators of mussels, could dive down 30 feet to get the mussels. So he, he was trying to figure out ways of dissuading, shall we say, the eider ducks from getting the mussels. You can see him around town as a very dapper man with a, a very swanky hat and a bow tie, and that, that was his uh, modus operandi. But on the shore, he, was, um, he just did his work, and he was, he was very knowledgeable and really did a, a, a good job of, of being the first person to really grow muscles successfully. The Darling Center expanded. They tore down the first building and built a, a brand new seawater system, and it is uh, still a very important institute in Maine. Across the river, Bob Guillard was working at the Bigelow Lab for Ocean Sciences. He was an algologist, and he came to Maine from the um, Woods Hole Oceanographic. He was, as an algologist, was as an algologist was culturing single-celled species of algae, and he had he began his collection in Woods Hole and brought it to Maine, and it is now 
the world's largest and most diverse collection. So anybody that needs to grow anything in shellfish in a, in a hatchery setting will be using a lot of the, the techniques that Bob developed, including something called the F over two culture medium. If you need a culture, you can go, you can send to the Bigelow lab and they can send a culture out to you. And so it's, it is um, world known and it's, it's still a, a very important part of the, the shellfish world. Down east in, in the Washington County, there were six communities that were in, in that area where their clam um, population and their harvest were going down the tubes. And they decided that they should have a small hatchery, taking a page from Sam's book. Um, so they built this, they took this little building that was on a, on a pier and built a hatchery for it and learned to grow soft shell clams, which are not all of that easy to grow in a hatchery. So they created this facility to spawn clams and raise juveniles. And it was the first public main shellfish hatchery back in 1987. They expanded it into this lobster place that I had next door to it. And Brian Beal is the man behind the vision. He's a professor at the University of Maine in Machias. And he was interested in, in developing this into a cold water facility and hatchery for, for the commercial culture of clams, Arctic sea clams, sea scallops, and oysters. And he collaborated with Sam. Sam was always around because because the, they had this collaboration going anyway. And it was a really nice, it, it has been a really nice um, com combination of these two outstanding men and their, their wonderful uh, practical ideas. That whole concept that has morphed into something called the Down East Institute, which is an amazing place. It provides education of youth and university students and has even um, facility for visiting public. But one of the things that they're doing is, is that it's the only cold water facility in the country. And they do a lot of collaboration with their counterparts across Passamaquoddy Bay in Canada. And so it's a, a cross country type of, of um, operation as well. And it's, they do some, some fabulous work up there. Okay, switching gears to the other side of the range um, is the Milford Lab, as, as we fondly call it. It is the National Marine Fisheries Service Laboratory in Milford, Connecticut. And I've talked about hatcheries, but this is the place where the hatchery actually got its start. The first director was Victor Lusanoff, and he developed a manual called Rearing Bivalve Mollusks. And once he and his team were able to, to uh, solve the mystery of how you get shellfish from egg and sperm to something Thing that can go and plant, be planted in the field under controlled conditions, things started to really change. And that work was not really done until the mid-century, 50s and 60s. And by the early 70s, uh, shelf, hatcheries were popping up in different parts of the country. And now they became a commercial venture as well as being used by institutions. The Milford Lab is still a very viable um, organization. It's the only shellfish laboratory under the National Marine Fisheries Service. At least three times that I remember, they have had real serious trouble with funding and the shellfish world has come to their rescue and saved them and said, we really need a shellfish facility. And they do work on all kinds of things, feeding, um, nutrition, and um, Gary on the left hand side is the lab director. He's also the uh, curator of their algae collection and he gives out, gives starter cultures to people needing uh, the cultures for their own laboratories, their own hatcheries, as well as the Bigelow lab. But they do research on all kinds of different uh, problems. A lot of those problems are brought to them through people who are working in the field. About that time in the 80s, uh, there was a huge drop in bay scallop production all over the, the range of bay scallops. And people really didn't know what was happening with the scallops, why that was taking place. The Milford Lab built this raceway farm, which is over here. They had outdoor raceway farms, and then they had some that were indoor as well, where they were able to manipulate some of the parameters, temperature, salinity, um, um, acidity, uh, all kinds of things, to try and figure out what was going on with the scallops. They developed a manual for hatchery culture of bay scallops, which 
that some people um, were using to raise scallops, which are notoriously finicky in, in lab conditions. They were also doing work in the field. And so on the left, uh, bending over is Ed Rhodes, um, standing up is Jim Widman, and on the other one is Ron Goldberg. Those are the three people who were doing a lot of the field work with the scallops. Because scallops swim, they need to be protected a little bit differently than other species of shellfish. So they borrowed the technique used in Japan with these lantern nets to see how that would work in our conditions. And they did all kinds of uh, work with scallops um, aside from that. So back in Massachusetts, between these two extremes in geography is um, what was going on here. In Massachusetts, each town manages their own shellfish resources under broad guidelines of the state, which is a sort of an odd system according to everybody else. Um, but what, ha what was happening was that there was no way for the towns to get more shellfish in the water except through transplants of, of shellfish from a place of high abundance to a place of low abundance. And so people like Phil Schwind, who is pictured here, was the shellfish constable in East Ham, and that's exactly what he was doing. He worked in a semi-enclosed pond and felt that because of this, the nature of it being semi-enclosed, that any larvae that, that was produced by these spawning cohogs would stay within the pond. And to some degree, he was really successful at it. But there weren't that many places where you had that kind of an environment. So he, he also often worked with his wife, and he did a lot of work with, with clams, cohogs, and uh, whatever he could do with scallops. When the, hatchery, when the hatcheries came a, a lot, not, well, not a lot, but when they were able to use commercial uh, production, then the towns and commercial people were able to buy seed from commercial hatcheries. The towns bought, and towns on Cape Cod, there were uh, five of us that, that started early on in the mid-70s, bought a small amount of shellfish from um, a, a hatchery in North Carolina. And there were a ton of questions. The first one was, would the, the seed survive an airplane trip from North Carolina to Massachusetts? Would they survive being transplanted in our water? Would they survive the winter? What kind of predation would there be? What kind of, of um, protection did they need? On and on and on and on. So we started with bottom culture. All of us started with bottom culture. And then a shellfish constable in Falmouth had developed floating sandbox rafts. With, uh, George Sousa was his name. And his rafts were, were bigger than ours. But they were floating in the water with, with sand in them. And he realized that because the cohogs need, uh, they live in the sediment, they must need the sediment. So by putting sand in these rafts, the cohogs were very, doing very well. And because they live on the bottom, their predators were on the bottom and they were on the top of the water, there wasn't much predation of them. So the floating sandbox rafts were, worked really well. However, they take up an awful lot of room. So some of the towns um, got into the hatchery business themselves and um, there was a high inflation rate at the time, and so seed was was going up in price, um, and it was getting to be prohibitively expensive to buy seed, or buy a lot of it anyway. So the first group was the Martha's Vineyard Shellfish Group in, um, in Martha's Vineyard, and they took a, a little building that they had and expanded it into a, a hatchery, a small hatchery. And then um, in East Ham was a, a real old boathouse that was used for the purpose, in Orleans was a building that was going to get torn down that we moved to the water. And in Howitch, there was another boathouse on a pier. The process was to get them to spawn. Um, usually, in this case, all of us were, we were working with cohogs. Um, Martha's Vineyard switched to a, a lot of other species as well as cohogs. But I think we all started with cohogs just at the beginning. But anyway, to get them to spawn and then put them in some sort of container which was these, we had trash cans. We were doing everything on the, on the cheap and you know, real nickel and dime operation. And then they had to be sieved every other day once you got some larvae, but we also had to grow the algae just like everybody else did. So we had to have an algae room. Luckily, um, a new uh, process came, a method came in for field culture and that was using um, what they call an upweller. And that's nothing more than a tank within a tank. And so we were using, again, cheap fish boxes, which were really cheap, and these buckets, which were free because, I mean, were cheap because they were free. Anyway, the water comes into the tank and it flows up through this, 
the container that has netting on the bottom where the shellfish is sitting on the bottom, and then it flows out into the bay through this outfall pipe. This worked really, really well for all of the towns because the, they could put a lot of shellfish in a small area and the survival rate was good. And now upwellers are used by just about every, um, everybody who's growing shellfish from uh, small seed. They all have some sort of a, an upweller facility and they're all over the country. Um, some of these towns expanded. East Ham's expanded from the little boathouse to this greenhouse which had pipes running all over the place for various things that they were doing. Chatham developed an, out an upweller facility and a building that they had. The Martha's Vineyard Shellfish Group expanded to its big greenhouse. It was the first solar hatchery in the country. And they also are using the old, the former lobster hatchery for part of their operations for an upweller. But cohogs weren't the only um, species that people were working with, we still were looking at clams as well, going back to the clam conferences. We knew that turning over the bottom seemed to be the most appropriate thing to do for the, the setting of clams. We didn't know if we planted juvenile clams in a protect, in a, in a um, plowed area, we actually used a plow, whether they would survive. So there's all kinds of experimentation going on. And we found out that yes, they did survive. And if you can see these straight lines of holes, those are clam siphons from the furrows that we were, um, where we would plant the clams. But this is a, a volatile environment right here with these with this shifting sands. And they still lived in that area, which was a, a good sign, but they didn't set there. We, so we put some netting down to see whether they would set under the netting. And they did set under the netting, but there weren't any clams anywhere around the netting. So just like in Maine, we all learned that you just can't cover up acres and acres of flats to protect the clams and try and get a new set of clams. It's just prohibitively expensive. And, and I think the Maine was doing the same kind of experiments, but they were finding out the same thing, that it worked. It worked really well, but it just was too expensive. These fences um, were some of um, Dana Wallace's experiments for trying to dissuade the green crabs to see if they would not get into the fences or over the fences, I should say. Well, I mentioned scallops being a um, um, the, the decline in the scallop harvest all over the all over the range. At the at the same time that that was happening, uh, Fred Short, who was one of the top uh, seagrass people in the world, was working in New Hampshire to look at eelgrass. And eelgrass was declining as well as the scallops. And so he was trying to find out whether it was a blight like it had been in the 30s that wiped up eelgrass all over the East Coast, or whether there was something else happening that was making the eelgrass decline. And his work in uh, University of New Hampshire was, was ended up to be very um, much in tune with what was happening with the scallops because what they found out was that the eelgrass was, the loss of eelgrass was because of degrading water quality and that that degrading water quality was because of nutrients coming in. So they're doing all kinds of experiments in New Hampshire to find out how much, how much nutrient was a bad, was turned out to be a bad thing. And, and so their work was, was um, settled on basically that part of it. Joe Costa in Woods Hole had done a um, study on the eelglass decline in Wakoit Bay, and he found that from 1951 to 1987, it ended up that most of the bay turned out to be no more eelgrass, and just this resident, resident population down by the, the um, inlet to the, the pond, I mean, to Wakoit Bay itself. All of this work was done at the same time that Scott Nixon in Rhode Island and Ivan Valliella at MBL in Woods Hole were working on the nutrient um, issue as, as well. And what they were looking at was the connection between the land use and the relationship to shellfish habitat. In Rhode Island, they developed these huge tanks called mesocosms where they were able to manipulate um, any kind of environmental parameter that they wanted to really. And, did, and find out what the manipulation did to whatever they wanted to add to it. Um, but here in, in, in Wakoit Bay, Ivan was working in, in Wakoit, and you can tell by what was happening, with, what Joe found with the eelgrass was this, sorry, was this 
tremendous development of um, houses, single family houses all around the Bay. And so all of a sudden they're, tr they're looking at things a little differently, a little bit more holistically and finding out that there is a, a very definite um, com combination between the, what's happening in the water and what's happening on the land. Those studies land ended up looking at water quality from another point of view, which was volunteer water quality monitoring. And up until this point, there was the thought that citizen scientists were not really useful because the information that they gathered may not be as strict as what you would get if you were highly trained from a university setting. Well, well they, Virginia Lee found out that that was not the case at all, and that you could train citizens to do the work of the water quality work, and at least to, certainly to get the samples. And the more samples you got, the more data you could work with, the better off you were. And so she wrote this manual for volunteer water quality monitoring, which became that Bible. That led to the first time that a bay was looked at holistically for a management plan looking at the inputs to the bay and how those inputs could be mitigated. One of the things that happened with that was to realize that there are groundwater, water, groundwater flows that actually come in, that actually turn into watersheds and the groundwater watersheds. Now watershed is delineating a watershed is nothing more than looking at two mountain ranges and a river in between and the water flows downhill so from both mountain ranges they come from different directions to the to the river basically the same thing happens underground under our feet where you have water that is flowing from uh, the inland area to the coast and that, that fresh water is always flowing to the the salt water the national park service was looking at the um differential in, um, in groundwater by looking at uh, this temperature gradient in, especially in late August, when the temperature gradient is the, is the highest. And the groundwater is a pretty constant temperature, but the salt water is, um, fluctuates. And so they were able to take a, an airplane with a thermal um, camera on it and lit literally look at the groundwater as it's flowing into the bay. Into the bay. And so all of this gray here is fresh water that is flowing in and that was a you could a able to visualize what was happening with the groundwater delineations because on this side you have a very thin area of of the watershed and a thick one over here that, that was showing through here you have a thin place here and then a very thick one here now we had a, a visual that we could show the public what was happening with the groundwater under their feet rolling, I mean, um, going to the estuary. In, New, in Long Island, they were having problems with a difference of a different sort. They had something called the brown tide, which was a, a very minute uh, species of algae that was clogging the gills of the scallops. So in their case, it was eelgrass, but it was also exacerbated by this brown tide that was um, uh, happening in, in predominantly in Baconic Bay, and you can see those all of those years that they would that they had this brown tide. So their scallop crop went down uh, very fast because of that, and, and and the lack of eelgrass. Well, putting all of this together, uh, the commercial people realized that they could now grow, especially cohogs, but oysters came in too, on a commercial basis. And they could put them on flats. They could they could um, cover them over with co the cohogs. They could they could put them. They plant them just on the flats. Cover them over like the towns had done. They realized that it worked. That they had they may have some predation, but it really it was it was worth what they were doing. And they went into business in, in big time uh, with commercial aquaculture. And as I said, cohogs were the first one, especially on the on the Cape. But when you put a lot of animals in, in, a, in a small space, um, very often you're gonna find some disease. And that disease is not a disease to us, it's a disease to the animal itself. And that's what happened with the cohogs, that this disease cropped up called QPX, which was cohog parasite unknown. And two researchers, Roxana Smolowitz, who was at Woods Hole Oceanographic and then Roger Williams University, and Walter Blagoslowski, who was at the Milford Lab, had been working on diseases for their whole career. And 
So Roxana turned her attention to the QPX when Walter continued working on oyster diseases of MSX and derma, which had been known in more southern waters um, and it had been around for a very long time. In New Jersey, they had, there was a, the Haskin Research Lab, and that was started by a father and son team called of Julius and uh, Thurlow Nelson. And then uh, Hal Haskin took over the reins, and now it's Dave Bushek that is the director. They were looking at the disease problem from a, all kinds of points of view, of what to do about the, the oysters themselves. But Susan Ford spent almost her entire career trying to develop uh, resistance strains to for oysters. And Stan Allen looked at a different way of, of just the um, a genetic, a different genetic process. So this, this, was, this was really important work also. And Susan unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but she did develop the re disease resistance strains um, before that happened and thank heavens for it. Now, putting all that together with the disease and the information that people knew about diseases, that's what started the um, industry that we have now. <clears throat> the hatcheries had, had solved all of the problems that they had, although um, there was a, a, a person that, that we met up in Maine who joked that we've not yet found a way to kill all the ways that we could kill shellfish, but that aside, because they are, they are tricky to work with. Um, that aside, the, the hatchery, hatcheries were in business, commercial hatcheries were in business. They could sub supply growers, growers could get leases, and, and off we are and running. And it is now this booming industry all over the country, primarily oysters, but other species are being grown as well. There's all kinds of gear, um, all kinds of people in the business, um, and there are people like Perry Rasso in the, the, this corner here who is in Rhode Island, who's doing it all from hatchery to table. Um, but it's, it's showing people what it, it, this is not for the faint of heart, for the people that, that, you know, you just put them in the water. There are problems too. Back in Maine, all of these guys were part of Herb's original group of, of graduate students back in the late 70s and mid 80s. They all went into business on the Damariscotta River and stayed there and are doing, they're still uh, in the business and are sort of the, the uh, backbone of the, the business in Maine, all except for Rich Lutz, who does his work in a different way, but he's also still involved in shellfish. And Dick Klein, who retired and sold his business. Bill Mook is monitoring ocean acidification and he got a group started with uh, um, shellfish growers, uh, ocean, I mean, yeah, Ocean Acidification, Acidification Collaborative. And he's working on, on looking at ways to get around the fact that ocean acidification is, is here and it is affecting shellfish because it's affecting everything that needs a shell and especially things on the near shore area more, more heavily than things in open ocean. So from Maine to Long, Long Island, the industry really boomed, and it, and it has um, continued to do so for these many years. But as I said, it's not easy. And it's, you often have things like fouling organisms that grow on your stock. And if you're not judicious in, in, being, in using good husbandry techniques, that's what you're going to end up with is your your shellfish being starved out because the, the fouling organisms are taking over. The um, East Coast Shellfish Growers Association put together a best management practices manual for people growing shellfish. And um, as part of the team, we went to um, every state on the East Coast to talk with extension agents, growers, and other stakeholders, managers, to see what would be the best management practices so that um, people would be doing their, using, doing their business in an environmentally sensitive way. Everybody knows that they need clean water to grow their business, but there's still ways that they can do it that are, that are better than others, I'll put it that way. Uh, but then there's shellfish restoration, and shellfish restoration is a, is a sort of a different kettle of fish where it's not commercial, it's usually um, uh, communities or uh, um, NGOs who are trying to 
use restoration for different purposes, to either add shellfish to bays and estuaries, to reclaim habitat or encourage shellfish to grow there, to mitigate the land use practices, to create reefs, to return native species and eliminate or reduce invasive species, to recruit train volunteers and training programs. And those last two are really, really important because by training volunteers and, and doing the training programs, citizens, individual people are learning what it takes to grow shellfish, what it takes to get um, an oyster, a plate of oysters for the cocktail party. And it's, it's amazing how, how much goes on with these, with the shellfish restoration. And uh, Dot Leonard and I worked together on a, a best management practice practices manual for shellfish restoration as well. And so there's, there's a lot of, of information out there to, to try and, and get people to look at what ha is happening with, with shellfish and that in order to grow shellfish and have it on the marketplace, it's got to be safe for human consumption. And there are, there are ways of looking at that as well. These volunteers do all kinds of things. They, they're working out in the fields, um, field planting, um, upwellers, all kinds of things. And they, they really like getting wet and dirty and they just have a good time. And they, most of the time they've got smiles on their faces and they just love helping. And, and they, they feel like they're giving something back and it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing to watch. Shellfish is also now being used to mitigate the nutrients that are coming in from the land. And I mentioned uh, the groundwater, but a lot of that is coming from the sep individual septic systems, which is why when I talked about Wakoi Bay, it was so um, disastrous. You had so many houses in such a small area. But the, the, what happens is that the septic system will take care of the, nutri of the um, bacteria very nicely, but it does not take care of the nutrients at all. That just goes down and filters through the sand, gets into the groundwater and goes out the pipe in, or, or, or down the road or just on the, on the side, like with that, all that gray water coming in that the thermal imagery was showing. Anyway, it's getting into the estuary. That's the, the final point. And although most of us would like to stop the nutrient at the, at the pipe itself, at the, it's the source, um, at least by doing it at the end of the pipe, it is helping the estuaries. And so with the filtering capacity that especially oysters have of up to 50 gallons a day per oyster, they are, they are treating, literally treating the, the body of water by removing the um, nitrogen that gets into their bodies. And once you remove the oyster, then that, all, that, all that nitrogen is gone from the, from the water body. Then we have the Billion Oyster Project. This is an absolutely amazing, amazing project. And the, the um, geniuses behind this are Pete Malinowski and Murray Fisher. And their goal is to put a billion oysters into New York Harbor by 2035. Now keep in mind, this is New York Harbor we're talking about. But they're, part, they're doing it a little differently. They're not a business. Um, they're not doing it commercially. They're doing it as an, an educational benefit and as it, they have this nonprofit that they, they, that they started. They partner with the public schools and the students and volunteers, and they have community scientists and restaurants. They educate people about New York City's rich, rich, rich oyster hatchery, I mean, history, which is phenomenal. It used to be the largest oyster producer in the country. And they're leading the movement to restore it. It's just an absolute phenomenal project. They take recycled shells from restaurants, and they're not the only people that are doing that. And it's a difficult thing to do because the, the, um, the shells have to, be, have to be cleaned and they have to be sit in, the, in, in um, a, a facility for over a year before they can be used. But they, they're, they're doing that to build reefs, which will, which will mitigate some of the, hopefully will mitigate some of the um, storm surges that come in, but also to attract oysters to the, the shells themselves. These are the numbers, and these are a couple of years old at this point, but I think that they're absolutely phenomenal. They've got 10,000 volunteers. They're working with 6,000 students, 100 New York City schools, and 75 restaurants. Just recently, they published a, a total curriculum for schools to be, that, that anybody can use. Um, it's just a phenomenal, phenomenal project. And there are other success stories. I've mentioned um, the Martha's Vineyard Shellfish Group. Uh, they have gone in so many different directions, um, raising cohogs, oysters, um, scallops. They've been able to keep a, a, um, 
commercial harvest of bay scallops going for years now. Um, scallops basically, uh, if, if there are any, have a normal yo-yo uh, population dynamic, uh, you know, good one year, bad, and that the next. But through their work, they've been able to, to equal out that yo-yo so that it's a little bit less of, of the yo-yo and be able to have an actual fishery there. Um, their, their work with, with other things like uh, Phragmites grass, and um, they just go in, in so many different directions. It's just an amazing, amazing operation. And then where I live in Duxbury, it became an, an, uh, a shellfish town. It, it had been, but in the last 20 plus years, they have gone from uh, developing their own hatchery, nursery, grow out, wholesale, retail restaurants. They've done the same thing that Perry has done in Rhode Island and go from, from hatchery to table. And it's just an amazing uh, thing to watch, especially because um, of, of some of the gear is... Um, you can you can visibly see it that some of it is floating gear and that is a problem in a lot of areas but in Duxbury it doesn't seem to be a problem people seem to be um, happy that they've got these oysters and growing in their own backyard and it, it's a it's a source of pride actually from what I've been able to see anyway then there are oyster festivals shellfish festivals there's a Pemaquid oyster festival in I think it's August I know I think it's in September the Milford oyster fest which is just thousands and thousands of people. The Wellfleet Oyster Fest that started uh, small and is now thousands of people, and that's in um, October. And then even in New Brunswick, Canada, uh, driving down the street, and here is this sign that says Festival of the Mollusks in August. So these are, these are important too for people that love shellfish. They may not know all the ins and outs of how, how they get the shellfish, but at least they're enjoying them. Milford Lab has done some uh, wonderful work aside from what I've talked about earlier. They have a, what is called the, the um, annual um, Milford Aquaculture Seminar. And they, it's a day and a half meeting and they have presentations by researchers from, from the Institute, but they also have presentations from anybody who submits an abstract. And a lot of it is practical information of what's going on in the field, not necessarily, um, um, in the institution, I mean, the uh, laboratory work, uh, could be a lot of field work too, uh, problem solving. Sometimes the problems are brought up in these meetings and then Milford they'll, then will work on them because they, they see that there's a need for something. It's just been a, a phenomenal and a, a great meeting, a great way to interact with, with the uh, researchers, the growers, managers, extension people, all in the same room at one time. It's, it's just been wonderful. So with that, I would like to thank um, all of these people. It's been uh, a, a journey to try and put all of this together. As I said in the beginning, other people would have chosen other things, but this is, was my way of trying to highlight as many of the highlights as I could. And I want to thank you and have all of these people who are our friends who also will get their hands dirty just shucking oysters because they just love shellfish, as we all do. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. Oh, wow, so um, so much uh, ground and water covered in all of that. Um, so a couple questions. Um, someone asks, uh, you refer to cold water fisheries, and they're wondering mm -hmm. if you could uh, elaborate on what makes a cold water fishery, so temperatures, implications. Um, Passamaquoddy, I was talking about um, Passamaquoddy Bay and cold water. It's, there's a, a it, it's all, it's all divided to currents. If you, the farther north you get, the colder the water is. So it's main, mainly just that. It's just, they're, they're, they're far north. And the down east Maine is as far northeast as you're going to get. So they've got the coldest water. There you go. Uh, someone, someone writing in, many, many thanks for this great educational program. Learned a lot. So um, Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I had a question for you about, uh, you mentioned at one point, um, uh, some collaborations with people in other parts of the country. And I'm wondering, do you have um, a much East Coast, West Coast collaboration? And um, do you find that you have similar kinds of issues, very, very different kinds of issues? Yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a lot of collaboration. Um, there's, a, there's a 
the, the West Coast has a different species of oyster that they grow. They're growing a uh, Pacific oyster uh, called uh, Jigas. It's the, the, the generic name for it. Whereas we grow the American oyster. So that's, the, that's a difference. But a lot of the problems are the same. The land use um, affecting the, the estuaries, that is certainly the same. Um, any problems that they're, they're dealing with, that the ocean acidification started, they, they started having problems when the hatcheries, we're starting to see it on the East Coast. Um, there, is, there are meetings with the National Shell Fisheries Association. There is a, a, a Pacific Shellfish Growers Association, a East Coast Grow, Shellfish Growers Association, and they get together and they, they also get together with a, what they call a walk on the hill, where they um, inform the legislators um, in Washington about issues to, um, of shellfish. So yes, there is a, a lot of collaboration going on. We, it, there's a lot of sharing. And there's similar problems, similar issues. Um, when, the, when there's a disease problem or a, a fouling problem or anything like that, that information is shared very widely. Wonderful. Um, let's see. I am a hobbyist cohogger in Little Harbor, Wareham. What's the outlook in Buzzards Bay for areas that are not artificially planted? I don't know specifically about Buzzards Bay, but I can tell you that the, um, let's put it this way. If you saw a graph of shellfish harvest of any species of shellfish, it would look the same from a, a high going down really pretty rapidly to a low and then sort of a leveling off at the low. So it's been a low area, a low uh, production for many areas for a very long time. And with the, with the, um, the municipalities trying to increase the shellfish, not, not doing it with not using the commercial people, but doing it themselves with their own propagation. That's, that's the only thing that I know of where they're trying to get more shellfish. And, and the propagation is just basically to help mother nature to put more shellfish in so that hopefully some of the, the uh, larvae will stay put around the area or, or they will increase the larvae and increase the shellfish. But it's still, it's still water quality. Water quality is the, is the bugaboo issue throughout the whole, throughout the whole country, really. Interesting. Uh, we have someone who says that they are interested in any new information about green crabs. Do you, do you have Do you have at least a few bullet points you might be able to share? Maybe, maybe not everything you know about green crabs. Um, no, but, but I can relate that there is a company, I think it's in Maine, and I'm, I'm sure that somebody will correct me, that is developing a beer using green crabs. So I have no idea how successful they are being, but <laughs> more power to them. I think if we can use these crabs in some way, then it'll be a, it'll be a boon to everybody. If, if we could convince more Americans that there's more and better beer for if we have <laughs> right. water quality, I right. think we might have a winner there. <laughs> right. I said, I'm sure, I'm sure I'll be corrected on that, but I'm, I'm almost positive that it was made and I'm almost positive it was a beer. So, <laughs> All right. Um, someone asked, how long does it take to grow a quahog and an oyster from seed to harvest? They're different, um, different species, so there's different requirements. Quahogs take a lot longer to grow than oysters, and oysters can be anywhere from a year and a half to two or three years. Quahogs can be up to seven years before they get to maturity. It depends on the, the um, area where they are. It, they can be, it can be a short time, too. In Florida, they, they can grow them pretty quickly, but um, in other areas, quahogs are just a slow-growing slow animal, so it takes, it takes them a lot longer. Oh, and okay. Another green crab question: Are green crabs edible? Can we? Uh, another good question. And that, I, as far as I know, no. But again, there are people who are trying to work on on some use for green crabs, including an edible use. There we go. Um, uh, someone who says they uh, they missed the very early part of your talk, but is anyone building oyster reefs in our area? Uh 
specifically, I don't know about our area, but I know that they are that there are oyster reefs being built basically throughout the whole east coast. Um, there are a lot of lot of groups that are building oyster reefs. So yeah, there are some, and I'm I'm pretty sure that there are some towns and some some NGOs that are that are building oyster reefs too. For um, especially now that that storm surge is becoming such an issue, then there are a lot of places that are are looking at building the reefs. All right. Um, oh, wait, another. <laughs> we have another entry into the green crab thread. <laughs> uh, Tamworth Distillery apparently is turning green crabs into whiskey. Whiskey. I'm sorry. It wasn't beer. It was whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, and uh, Sandy, I was just uh, curious if people are um, are interested in the whole um, citizen science uh, angle to all of this, are there particular organizations in the area that would be best for them to um, contact about that? Um, on the Cape, you can contact the individual town and see what they mm -hmm. are doing on the individual towns. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> elsewhere, elsewhere um, there are a lot of um, um, non-government organizations, NGOs that are working on it, especially the Nature Conservancy. But uh, things like Audubon are working on different things where they could use some help. Um, the uh, Center for Coastal Studies. Um, a lot of the, the smaller groups are doing things on their own where you look at an environmental organization and just check it out and see what they're doing and see if they need a hand. All right. Oh, and here we, we, we're back to green crabs. <laughs> okay. Uh, someone writes in, green crabs are edible. There is a cookbook of green crab recipes and a nonprofit working with restaurants and chefs, greencrab.org. Well, okay. Thank you very much. That is new news for me. <laughs> Fascinating. All righty. Well, thank you again, Sandy, for, um, for a, a really wonderful kind of bird's eye view of um, as so many interesting shellfish developments over the last century, really. Um, so thank you once again for, uh, for gracing us again with your presence and all your knowledge. Um, and uh, thank you. Just to um, uh, put a little reminder in people's ear about what else we have going on at the museum in the next few weeks. So on Tuesday evenings, we have a drop-in lofting class. If you've ever wondered how to take boat plans and scale them up to full size, this is the class for you. Uh, it's a drop-in. You can come once. You can come every week, completely up to you. So that's on Tuesdays uh, from 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, coming up on uh, November 8th, we have a Nantucket bracelet workshop class. So if you've ever uh, wondered how to weave a beautiful bracelet uh, sort of in the style of Nantucket baskets. Uh, Caitlin Parsons, uh, the daughter of Jim Parsons, a renowned Nantucket basket weaver, uh, is going to um, be doing a workshop. So something to look forward to. And then two weeks from today on November 13th, uh, we have Jack Fritch, uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Nantucket's uh, Antiques Depot. Uh, we'll be talking about Nantucket baskets. So a bit of a um, a bit of a thread there in uh, November about um, all kinds of Nantucket weaving subjects. So we uh, hope you, that you will join us for some of those. And in the meantime, please stay well, and we hope to see you soon. Take care. Thank you very much. <laughs>